We're facing a wave of big changes in marketing with AI, and nowhere is this more evident than in the world of SEO. With AI becoming an integral part of search engines, it's time to rethink our approach to SEO. Uh, last year, I would build content around all the top of funnel users that want to explore something. Now, I'm still driving what the search user is, but the search user has changed because they're now more informed. So they're no longer top of funnel, they're going to be mid funnel. In this Marketing Pops episode, you learn first how Eli's approach to SEO has evolved, second, the importance of understanding the user's intent, third, the role of AI in shaping the future of SEO, and fourth, how building a habit of writing accelerated Eli's career. Now, I've created a free PowerPoint cheat sheet that you can download, fill in, and apply Eli's SEO strategy for AI. You can download it at marketingpowerps.com right now or find that link in the show notes and description. Are you ready? Let's go. Marketing Power Ups. Ready? Go! Here's your host, Ramley John. Talk about uh, marketing pops around AI and SEO. You've been writing a lot about it. You're the author of product-led SEO. I'm sure you have a ton of opinions about about it, specifically on Google's SGE, the search generative uh, experience that they came out with. Uh, you write a poll on it on LinkedIn if it's overhyped or underhyped, but I don't think you listed exactly what your thoughts are on it. Maybe not to influence people's opinions on that poll, but what is your thoughts on on it that you've already viewed it so, uh, i mean it's only been a few weeks that has been out in the wild but over hype under hype i was so the, the polls actually you know i i spent seven years almost seven years at server monkey so I, I understand polling more than most i'm mm. certainly no polling expert but i understand polling more than most it's actually a bad poll i have to criticize my own poll it's a bad poll because you don't want to ask a question like say i was doing market research Right. And I wanted to create another SGE, I wanted to compete against Google. There's actually nothing to bite into here. What's the mm. word overhyped or underhyped? Is it the product? Is mm. it the marketing? Is it the impact? Right. So, like, I knew that when I wrote the poll that yeah. I was not writing a good poll, but it, because I wanted to write a poll that would create engagement. So that's why I made it very specific or like actually too broad, not specific. The way to make a poll, if I was looking for like statistical significance and to do product research, would be, uh, you know, for your listeners, the qu the poll question was, is Google's generative AI? And then I had two options, overhyped, underhyped. The correct statistically significant way to write the poll would have been, is Google's generative AI blank impact or product overhyped or undersold or something like more specific? So then I could say, oh, there's an opportunity here because most people think the product is weak, so I'll make a better product. But when I just did broad overhyped, underhyped, I brought out all the opinions. So some people are voting overhyped because the product sucks. Some people are voting overhyped because the marketing around it sucks. Some people are voting right. overhyped because they expected mm -hmm. it to like destroy SEO and it didn't. Yeah. And for those people, just wait, it will destroy SEO. It just, it's been released to a very small amount of people. So that I, is mostly a poll around engagement. My personal opinion yeah. came from two weeks ago where mm -hmm. I wrote up one of the most viral LinkedIn posts ever, where I wrote that I think most people are underestimating the impact on SEO from Google's SGE. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is because I, um, as I think I mentioned in, in our, our last podcast, so I'm fortunate to live in the Bay Area, in Silicon Valley, and all of my neighbors work for tech companies. So NVIDIA, like everything. So yeah, that you don't hear actual secrets, but like I hear enough. So I've been hearing from like the Googlers who were like bragging, essentially bragging to me about, oh, wow, this, this thing is amazing. I can't tell you more about it, but it's just on every query. And I'm like, on every query? Like even on shopping queries, they're like, oh, it's, I, oh, I can't tell you more. So like I started hearing that. And then that's when I started thinking like, wait a second, Ever, all the pundits are out there saying, you know, it's just going to be like chat GPT. If you write, like, write me a 400 word blog post mm. on, you know, statistical significance, it'll do it, but better than, than chat GPT because it's Google. But then I started thinking, well, what if it is on broad queries? What if it's on single word queries? What if it's on shopping queries? What if it's on, you know, navigational queries like right. Gmail login? That mm -hmm. changes everything. So as I started, again, talking to more Googlers and I even got a sneak peek of it. I convinced a Googler to be like, hey, no one knows if you show it to me, just show it to me. So I saw it, right? So like I saw it before it launched and I think that it's going to destroy SEO because mm. it changes everything. It's like, again, it 
overnight. Like imagine you built up your entire Facebook following and like you're all in on Facebook yeah. and then Facebook's like, oh, we just changed the algorithm and like you're done. It happened to so many people. It happened to Zynga or like Twitter. Let's say someone built their entire inbound on Twitter and then Elon Musk is like, oh, we're breaking the whole thing. There's your inbound. That's what's happening to Google. And I think people don't realize that because they're not using this, not hearing these things, and they're making false assumptions that it's basically ChatGPT and a Google experience. And Bing sort of ruined this for everyone because if you tried ChatGPT and Bing, Bing ruined a lot of things. But if you try ChatGPT and Bing, it's a bifurcated experience. Like, would you like to converse with the algorithm? Or would you like to just do a query? But in Google, it's not. It's like defaulted to like, here is generative. Like I just do a query for the city Miami and you get a generative response. So mm. if you are Wikipedia, you just lost a lot of traffic. So yeah. that's where I think it changed. That's why I think people are underestimating. So my question, overhyped, underhyped, not a real statistically significant <laughs> question, just designed to, to get people to vote. Said that most websites traffic will decline by 30 to 50%. Google ad campaigns will see massive decrease in clicks and spends. And you're, you're also suggesting that because of that, uh, Google's ad revenue won't, you know, will suffer because of that. And I feel like that's exactly what that is. Like Google's like biggest revenue cash cow right now is their ad business. And they're going to have to figure that out really quickly or else they're, they're, they're killing the cash cow essentially. They're not killing the cash cow. So this is, this is the thing. And this is, again, I, I spent a lot of time on, with Google things and, and talking to mm. Googlers and being on, like spending time on Google products and looking at what they do. So this is the thing about what's happening here. Google had LLMs and LLMs are not that complicated from an AI standpoint. I have another post coming out of my newsletter. You know, when you do have a self-driving car, the, it produces a, uh, I think a gigabyte of data every second. It takes all the what? cameras. So let's say a Tesla, you have all those cameras, takes all the cameras It takes radar and LIDAR and then takes sensors from the road, like the actual physical yeah. things in the road with the cars next to it, all those things. And it makes decisions. An LLM is not in, in within the English language. There's only 600,000 words. So when it's producing content, it's choosing what the next of those 600,000 words are. And it happens to be of those 600,000 words. The average person only knows 40 to 60,000 of them. So it's really only using 40 to 60,000 words to make a decision. It's not making a decision about what the sentence will say. It's yeah. making a decision about what the next word will be. So you write the word what? It's like, okay, what are all the possibilities of things that will come after the word what? There are not that many possibilities. That's what an LLM is. So this is, you know, this is what's happening within search. Now, Google invented this a long time ago. So they said, oh, well, we had this, but they couldn't launch it. The reason they couldn't launch it is because they have a brand and um, ChatGPT said some really offensive and weird things. And Google can't say offensive and weird things because it's Google. So they, they didn't launch LLMs and they didn't really find a way to integrate LLMs into search. ChatGPT launched it. Then ChatGPT launches, everyone's like, oh, Google's old technology, they can't do this. So right. Google had to catch up. So they launched BARD, but it was bad because it made some mistakes in the launch and they lost 10% of their stock price that day. So now Google, they're integrating it properly. Again, not such a difficult thing because they already had it under the hood. So there's putting it into the search experience. What again, wait, if you're not paying attention, this is a five alarm emergency for Google. Mm, ChatGPT yeah. can take away market share globally from Google. That will cost billions and billions of dollars that cannot be made up. It's very, look at Bing. Bing has every single advantage going for them and they cannot conquer market share. Uh, Microsoft is on 75% of all computers around the world. So I'm, I'm on a PC. 75% of all desktop computers around the world run Microsoft. A, a, an insane percentage of them, and I can't do the math because I've never been good at this, but like if Google has 90% of 90 plus percent of market share of searches and Chrome, I think is 80% of market share of browsers. browsers. So within 75% of people that buy a, a Windows computer, the first thing they do is open up Edge, which is what is now of what used to be Microsoft Internet Explorer. They open up Edge. They go to Chrome and they download Chrome and then they change their default search engine to Google. So Bing and has every advantage. You come, you buy a computer, 75% right. of people buy a computer and it's running Bing and they go to Google. So if Google loses market share to ChatGPT, which they're doing, not with this, you know, a lot of people, with some people are saying, oh, I'm not Googling anymore, that doesn't come back. 
And if that doesn't come back, they lose ad revenue because there's mm. just no searches there. So in Google, this is a five alarm emergency. Now, the reason I said that I think Google is going to lose ad revenue, again, based on information I've had with friends and colleagues and neighbors that are Googlers, they, they ask me questions. Like, what do you think Google's going to do with ads? I'm like, well, you tell me. You work at the company. So they don't know. So that, that is my thing. I was like, well, Google's rushing this thing. This is, this is another thing. This is total inside information. Hopefully all, all my friends are not listening to this and please keep sharing information with me. But uh, this is another thing that people had wrong, but I, I heard from my, my inside sources. Everyone's like, oh, Google's going to launch their new SGE that they said in IO. It's going to be like H2. It's, it's going to be like, you know, September, bef right before the holidays, they'll test it. I heard from my Google friends. They're like, oh, they're launching it next week. And I'm like, oh, that, that actually yeah. makes more sense. Yeah. Right? So the beta, the beta happened two weeks ago. So I, I knew that. They gave me the date. Right. They told me when it was launching. So the beta was launching because Google is desperate. There's a five alarm emergency. This right. isn't a new product. Like this isn't like Apple's new VR. We're like, hey, guess what? This is really cool. It'll be in stores, you know, around Christmas time. Like, no, if Google waits that long, they could lose market share. So they yeah. can't wait. So if you're paying attention, Google's losing market share. They're rushing this thing out. They don't, they haven't really figured out ads yet. You add that all up, like mm, they'll probably lose some ad revenue. So that was, okay. that was that prediction. Again, I, I didn't take, I didn't write those things saying, yeah. oh, I guarantee it. This is just like my sentiment. People are like, oh, you're totally wrong. And I got all these crazy comments and tweets. I'm not an analyst. Like, this is just my opinion. I'm entitled to my opinion, just like everyone else's. And you're right. I think they're, they had to rush to, to, to do this. And because of that, you're, you're saying that their ad revenue is going to get hit. The question now is like figuring out how to crack that. And people are talking about like, where do you, at, where do you show the ads? Is it like right in the responses or is it somewhere else? And I think once they do figure that out, they probably will figure it out. They, they need to figure that out or else they they'll... will. But it, the timing of the figuring out is not the same timing as this thing launching. Like everyone says, oh, they're not going to let anybody in the beta for a long time. Again, the beta already started. I've been in the beta right. for two weeks. So I'm in the beta. There are no ads within the generative mm. experience. There are ads on top. There are ads you know, underneath it sometimes, or sometimes there's no ads. That's a disruption. So I actually, I'm starting to see ads on top of generative where I didn't see that before. Thinking like a big company, I don't know if you ever worked at a big company before, but like there's a lot of voices and there's a lot of like power in politics. Yeah. So power in politics yeah. probably stood on the side of generative experiences in the search. Like, oh no, ChatGPT is eating our lunch. We got to launch a generative experience. And then they kicked the ad person out of the room. And then the ad person found the other door and they come in like, oh, yeah. no, 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 no. We got to put ads. So then they start pushing generative down. So we're, we're actually seeing this big company push and pull thing. We're like, you know, some analyst from like BlackRock's like, hey, I'm doing a lot of Google searches and I don't see ads. No ads. And then like, they're like, let's put a gap. So that's what's happening. And that's big company stuff. And also, you can't underestimate Google's ability to totally screw it up because they're a big company. Or like, they need to go back to the drawing board. ChatGPT did not, or OpenAI did not have a lot of employees before they launched this thing. Yeah. So they just could launch it, and then it gets big and complicated. And then you need sales mm. teams, and then yeah. you need strategy meetings and sales kickoffs. You need an event person to manage yeah. the sales kickoff. You need a recruiter to like do phone screen. Like again, when you're small, you can do a lot of stuff. So Google's this big company. They're trying to launch things, but then someone's going on vacation because it's, you know, it's July. So, and that person's gone, right? So that's big company stuff in, in open AI. Like, oh, no, 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 you, no vacations. Like, no vacation. We're, we're actually taking market share from Google. Right. Go to Yosemite next year. Yeah, right. And Sam Altman, the CEO of uh, ChatGPT, is like, everybody's coming back to the office. You know, nobody's like working remote. So like, they're like all hands on deck in this AI. Exactly. War. So Google may screw this up because they're big. Right. Or this is the other thing. Uh, Google may be like, hey, we could deal with a couple quarters of lower revenue. Let's mm. just see what happens. And like, again, I'm coming out from perspective of marketing and perspective of SEO. Uh, the company that drives all of your revenue, them messing around just to see what happens, that's scary. Like, what that if they're scary. like, Google's like, oh, what if we do all generative? You know, we'll lose some money. But for the companies that depend on that they lose everything before i continue i want to thank the sponsor for this episode 42 agency now when you're in scale up growth mode and you have to hit your kpis the pressure is on to deliver demos and signups and it's a lot to handle there's demand gen email sequences rev ops and more and that's where 42 agency founded by my good friend camille rexton can help you 
They are a strategic partner that's helped B2B SaaS companies like ProfitWall, Teamwork, Sprout Social, and HubDoc to build a predictable revenue engine. If you're looking for performance experts and creatives to solve your marketing growth problems today and help you build the foundations for the future, look no further. Visit 42agency.com to talk to a strategist right now to learn how you can build a high efficiency revenue engine. Thank you also to the sponsor for this episode, Ahrefs Free Webmaster Tools. Now, if you want to rank your website higher in search engines, you have to make sure that your website doesn't have any technical SEO issues. Because if you do, that's like trying to run a race with your shoes tied together. That's how you lose, and we don't want that. Luckily, Ahrefs Free Webmaster Tools can crawl up to 5,000 pages to find 140 common technical SEO issues that could be holding your site back from generating valuable traffic can also help you find your strongest backlinks as well as analyze keywords you're ranking for and see keyword search volume and ranking difficulty for each of those keywords. You can sign up for free at ahrefs.com forward slash webmaster tools or find the link in the description and show notes. Well, let's get back to the episode. I think all, all of these changes, big companies have had this knee-jerk reaction, especially with tech layoffs. It was like, Let's lay off our SEOs. <laughs> and you're like, that's super dumb. And you're actually uh, in your newsletter, which I link, a really great newsletter. I'm subscribed. Uh, anybody, marketer should be checking it out on Substack. You suggested that SEO skills, especially strategic ones, uh, skills are even more crucial in this post AI uh, world and it's more in demand. That's a really interesting thing. And this is one of your posts on LinkedIn that actually did really well because it's this contrarian point of view, uh, what other people are saying where like, you know, SEO is dying. SEO is, a, 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 I'm curious why that is, why you think SEO skills is even more in demand in this new changing landscape for search. So I'm going to hold two of those truths at, at the same time. SEO, SEO is dying and SEO is more important. SEO 2022 is, is on its deathbed mm. because the rules have changed almost overnight or they're changing and some people have not realized that they're changing. So for example, a big part of SEO in my entire career has been keywords. Mm. Keywords are not going to matter as much anymore. So like if you're like reporting on keywords, but then Google doesn't give you back keyword data and your traffic doesn't come based on keywords, suddenly right. reports are blown up. Links. I don't know how links matter yet, or I don't know if anybody will know how they matter within an SGE world. Because if you look at the sites that get their content stolen mm -hmm. from by Google and like it's in the SGE response, those are not the top ranked sites. They don't even have the most links. So who knows like yet how links matter? Again, the, the generative, like I, I alluded to this earlier, generative is based on statistics and it's looking at the likelihood of the next word coming after the each word that there's no links in that. So mm. I don't know, like it, it's an average almost. So you can have a poor piece of content and a good piece of content. One of them is links, but they both contribute to that average and then it creates new content. So it's not even sourcing a single piece of content. Interesting. What the SGE does is just mention something that might be similar and related, but it's not taking one particular content to develop an answer because statistics like Google is not a medical expert, but it can give really good medical responses because it's looking at the statistics behind it. So it's not saying, oh, this WebMD article convinced me that this is um, lupus, right? I don't know if you ever watch that show HouseMD. So Google's going to be like HouseMD, right? So like, it's always lupus. So like, it's not that that article convinced it's lupus. It's just like when it looked at all the things, the average came out. It's like, oh, it's lupus. Totally. Right? So it's going to be hard to source to anything because it's not sourced from anything. It's sourced from everything. So therefore, mm. how do links matter? So a lot of the traditional SEO skill sets that existed don't exist, will, will not matter anymore. However, everything changes, meaning if you still care about search traffic, you still want to develop a strategy to drive that search traffic. You can't just say, well, there went the SEO channel. I, I'll just, I'll, I'll just let it go. You know, I'll, I'll see mm. what happens. It's going to, you know, hopefully luck shines on me doesn't work like that. You need someone to help you come up with that strategy and to figure out what the new way is. Again, there'll be some new way of reporting. There'll be some new way of creating content. There'll be some new way of doing everything. The old way can't exist. The same way, um, you know, the car mechanics, right? I, I think that's a good comparison. Hmm. 
the old mechanic 20 years ago had a wrench and they, you know, dug into stuff. The new mechanic, car mechanic, the new car mechanic is maybe less wrench driven and maybe mm. more software driven. So it change. Yeah. You're still fixing a car. You're still like putting that. on brakes, but the brakes may have more technology in them than just right. like, you know, manual, let's just put this in the right place and tight screws. So you still need that layer. It's just what that person does is different. Like, I don't think we'll ever be in a world where you don't have someone that guides this channel and just like, right. well, SEO is just like the thing that comes in this yeah. month. It was like $60 million and la- next month it's zero. Like, no, someone has to control right. that. So I think humans will always exist in the seat. The same way, like social media is like, oh, but social, it really depends on the people. Like, no, no, you have social media managers that kind of curate the conversation. Yeah, so that, that that's that's why I think this SEO skill set, I don't know if we call it SEO skill set, the SEO person, the owner right. is still very, very important, but the skill set for sure changes. What I'm hearing is like, I love that analogy with the car mechanic because things evolve. Like even like how things were done, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm trying to, how doctors were like 20, like 50 years ago, they had to evolve, you know, now you need to use computers to like log stuff with, with your CRM. So uh, that really makes sense. You wrote this post about like, okay, so SEOs have to adapt. They have to change uh, in this new world. And people are like thinking about like, okay, sure. Like what is, what is, how do we adapt our strategy for this new world? And you wrote once again, this excellent uh, newsletter post uh, that I'm going to link in the show notes and description of like, first draft and i think people are like really craving for this because like everything's unknown right now what is what does that look like what is a seo strategy in a post ai world look like so i, I want to go back to my book because i predicted this whole thing in my book and like i knew it I love it and it was coming i'm just kidding <laughs> so my, my my book um just like your book they're cousins they're product led <laughs> they're siblings so my book, Product Led SEO, right. the, the hypothesis and thesis of my book is that you want to build SEO around a user. And when you understand what the user wants, you create a product around that user. And the way I mm. refer to product in my book and the way I always refer to product is not a thing like it has to be a, a widget for somebody to use. It's right. really the asset that I'm creating for SEO. Is it a glossary? Yeah. Is it a piece of content? It's product driven, like there has to be a user for it. It's not keyword driven of like I Googled it and I found a, key, a keyword there. So therefore I'm going to create content for it. So it's product driven. It's really driven around the user. So in that sense, my approach to SEO doesn't change whatsoever. Maybe a last year I would build content around all the top of funnel users that want to explore something. Now I'm still driving and building product, a product around what the search user is. But the search user is cha- has changed because they're now more informed. So they're no longer top of funnel. They're going to be mid funnel. So as an example, say a, a travel user, they're looking to go on a vacation to Europe. So they may ask a question or not even a question. Actually, this is, this is a, a standard SGE response, which guy, by the way, Google gets wrong. They want to find out what is a, an eight hour flight from New York. Like I want to go, I want to go to Europe, but I want to fly eight hours, about eight hours. So Google might give them the response in the past. The response to that question might have come from, you know, a, a website like the points guy or something like that. And then you read a bunch of stuff and then you've incorporated information. And then you're like, you know what? I think I'm, I'm going to go to Italy. I'm going to go to Rome. And then from there you go and do some more queries. I want to find some hotels. I want to find some Airbnbs. I want to find things to do. I want to, I don't want to see what currency they use and what visas I need. That's the search journey. Now in this generative world, you start with your first question, which is, I want to fly eight hours from New York. And the SGE says, well, here's your options. You can go to Rome or you can go to Paris or you can go to London or something like that. And then the Google has given you that answer. And then you're like, oh, Rome sounds kind of cool. So then you're like, uh, what, how many days do I need in Rome? Again, SGE gives you the response. So Now you're no longer a top of funnel user. So if you were um, the points guy or your trip advisor, those questions and that kind of content has now been answered by the search engine. You cannot, you can no longer get that search. What you will get is what are the best hotels? What are the locations of those hotels? Very specific things that have specific experiences. Now, ultimately, 
These are physical things that need to happen. Like I, SGE is never going to be your hotel. You need to go to a hotel. SGE is never going to be your plane. It's never going to be um, the Colosseum in Rome. It's not going to be those things. You, someone is still going there. So the TAM of people doing those trips and doing those experiences has not changed. What has changed mm. is the top of funnel, which is more tire kickers, more traffic. So maybe TripAdvisor monetizes right. some ads. Maybe the yeah. points guy monetizes with some ads. Those things that actually did though that all disappears because Google has now gobbled it up or ChatGPT or whatever, whatever engine. That by the way, an LLM world means that there will be more other competitors to Google. So good luck, Google. Uh, but that that's that's what this means. So now going back to my first draft of a strategy and going back to product led SEO, it's still around a user, just the user has changed. The user is now right. more educated, more informed, actually a more specific user. So if you are um, the Coliseum, for example, selling tickets, so it may be that you got more tire kickers. So you got more people who went to the Coliseum's website uh, and they're like, oh, how much are tickets? Oh, like a billion euros. No, I'm not going to the Coliseum today. Right. But now, now people are like, they're already informed. The, you know, TripAdvisor has told them because it's part of the journey where SGE has even told them how much the cost is, how much time it is, like how long the lines will be to get in. And they're like, I'm ready to go. So the conversion rate right. on the Coliseum's website will now jump up. Cause again, the TAM doesn't change. The experience changes, the traffic changes. So that's when I say first draft of a strategy, focus on the mid funnel user, build the product around the mid funnel user. The other thing I, I'm advocating for, and again, I, we don't know. It's all new, right? The cool thing about LLMs and AI is that Google doesn't know either. In the past, I think there may have been some geniuses at Google who could reverse engineer the algorithm and say, you know, I, I under, this is how a link works. This is domain authority. This is the way it works. You get this and it's going to work out perfectly. Now, I actually don't think you could actually say, how do links matter? We don't know because it's a neural mm. network. It's training itself. Right. The, you see the outcome. You don't really know all the inputs because there are millions or at least tens of thousands of inputs that came out with this output. It's hard, much harder to figure out. So what, what ends up happening is that you need to create content around this user and you need to build around this user. And the closest I can get to like an indication of what this user might be is questions like people also ask. So these mm. are actual real questions coming from real users. And that's again, part of my first job of strategy. These are ideas. So it's not around top of funnel keywords. You go to Ahrefs, you go to SEMrush. These are things people are looking for. Rome tickets and Rome cost. And I'm going to build all this content around Europe travel, right? It's right. not about that anymore. It's going to be about, can I see a question? Can I see the Coliseum and, I don't know, Parthenon in the same day, right? right. Like that is a much more specific. And then you write an experience about that and it's more mid-funnel. Interesting. That makes sense. And like you're asking, like you're trying to understand what other related questions people might have about the Coliseum, like how, when is the busiest time? Uh, you know, when, what is the temperature? Like if I don't like it hot, when should I go? Like all this stuff is what you're suggesting is like focus on the user and try to understand related questions they might have about that problem is exactly what I'm, is that what I'm hearing? Exactly. So again, we're still focusing on the user. We're still focusing on not actually it's even better. So because there's an inability to do this. When I said focus on the user, the opposite of focus on the user was don't spam the engine. Don't focus on the engine. Now you can't. You can't. We're going to spam AI. Not going to work. Right. right? So that yeah. it, we're still focusing on the user and we're building around an actual user because that's all that's left. Right. That makes sense. I like how that's, yeah, you're focusing on that user and then top of the funnel, SGE or some kind of AI will like present and guiding them to the middle or bottom of your funnel to, to really service and create that experience. One other part that you mentioned in that uh, newsletter post that you wrote is around the importance, even more so importance of relevance and authority around this. How do you see that fitting into the future? Obviously, it's going to be super, super important, but like, what are your thoughts, um, you know, of how that will play, of how, how to build that uh, even more? It, are you building experts, like uh, you, a, per, a person within the company as experts or like the company becomes an expert on something? Like, I'm curious what your, your take is on. I don't really, yeah, I don't really know yet. I think it, we need more time to understand mm. how this works and who's supposed to do this and what a company will be good at. I think for now, there should be experts within companies that 
incorporate this information and incorporate this experience so they can channel this back. I'm actually getting, you know, a ton of emails and I like it. Uh, quick, deeper questions about like, hey, uh, what do we do? And it, it's fascinating to me. So you need someone within a company that can translate like, hey, this is what's happening. This is what we'll do. It, I think there's so many people that are, again, underestimating what's going to happen. Google is going to launch this thing. It's going to be a, a public product launch. And Google is going to be like, hey, guess what? SG is here because they want to introduce users. And maybe they'll make you watch a little video like this here. And then companies are going to be like, oh, this is really cool. This new Google. And they're going to send screenshots of Google saying weird, maybe offensive things and all that. Like the stuff people do with chat GBT. Right. And then they're going to see the traffic analytics. And they're like, what happened here? So they're, they're not like looking at both sides of the picture. All those great answers are going to steal lots of traffic. So I know Wikipedia is not for profit, but Wikipedia might care about their traffic. They're about to lose a ton of traffic yeah. because a lot of what Wikipedia does can be distilled into quick answers. So the same way you go to like ChatGPT and you're like summarize this 1500 word blog post yeah. into three bullets. No more reading Wikipedia. You, you got it. It's coming in SGE. <laughs> um, you're, what do you suggest to people, those companies, you know, it's already happening, especially to talk with the other SaaS companies or marketers that, uh, that is in space. I'm hearing like chatter and like traffic definitely being hit. And what, what is your suggestion and tips for them? Um, you know, maybe even like taking a look at like, sure, your traffic went down, but like, what was your qualified traffic like even hit at all? Like your signups? Like, I'm curious what your advice is for companies that are seeing that hit in traffic. Yeah. So, uh, this is, this is the, the reason I wrote my book. Uh, I think that most companies do not have SEO strategies from my experience mm. doing SEO for, you know, almost two decades. Most companies do not have SEO strategies. They had SEO tactics mm. and they have SEO traffic, but there was no real strategy around it. I just talked to a, a public company and I, I talked to a PM who's like, there, she was frustrated that her boss, I mean, a coworker who leads SEO kept telling her stuff to do. And like, it didn't align into anything. I'm like, what's the point of doing that? And she's like, I don't know. We just do it. And then we move on to the next one. That's not strategic. Mm. Who are like, again, part of my book is, is on this, like, it's a, it's a, you're building a product. So therefore there's all these pieces that build together and they ladder into like strategy to who the user is, what you're trying to convert, how you, when you have a product, you measure it, of course. So a lot of companies don't have strategy. They're not, they don't know who the user is. They're just like, oh, we found this on SEMrush. These are the 10 things that we're going to write this week. And then these are, we're doing an SEO audit. So therefore we're going to spend like three months fixing all these errors. They're, and they're going to like, but there's no why. And there's no like, mm -hmm. how do you, what's the reason you're going to do all these and how do they add together into something? So I think most companies, from my experience, do not have SEO strategies. So now they're going to get a you know, big hole blown through their traffic if they would like to get that traffic back or get any traffic whatsoever, you need a strategy. So you need to say, I would like to reach all 18 to 25 year old college students in this area who are doing this search. How am I going to do that? And that should help inform what you're going right. to do, like what content you need to create, what are their demands? What are, what do they expect to do? What are they willing to pay? What sort of calls to action instead of like, well, I'm going to write a bunch of content and I'm just going to put a blue call to action on it. And that's SEO, right? So like it needs to be so much more strategic and holistic. So that's what I would say companies need to do is like, oh, if, you, if you'd like your SEO traffic, you do it. And I, I think it's funny, like when it comes to SEO, because there's so much mystery around it and in other channels, there's no mystery. You, No one doesn't have a paid strategy. Not like, oh, so I, I talked to this agency and they said we should spend $100,000 a month. So I just cut them a check. <laughs> Right. There's like, what are you trying to, what's your message? What are you trying to do? What day you're advertising? What's your LTV? What are you bidding on? Like, how are you measuring it? When do you pull the plug? Like, there's a strategy. Same right. goes with social media. It's not like <laughs> you don't have no, there are very few companies. I know there are some companies that get away with it. It's like, they just like hand a phone to a, a Gen Z and be like, just stream your mind. Just. <laughs> TikTok, go TikTok. <laughs> whatever, whatever comes up, just, you know, put it out on our corporate feed. Like, like it doesn't happen. It's like you have a, there's a content right. roadmap of all the things you're going to be mm. doing on social media. Who are you reaching? Right. How are you following up with them? That's a strategy. But when it comes to SEO, it's like, 
I, I did a report. This is what our content gap is. So that's what we're doing this quarter. Right. So I think this is going to require companies to be more strategic or it's going to require them to, I mean, the word they'll lose the traffic. And I, I see a huge opportunity going back to your question about like SEO being more important. You need someone to explain this to them and say, mm. this is what happened. This is what we right. need to do. Today, everything is different. So mm. I'm, I'm excited about that opportunity. It's super exciting. I think what you what I'm hearing is like, think beyond SEO and think about the bigger experience and picture. And it was one of the things that you mentioned in that uh, newsletter post about how if you're building reports around keywords, you're going to see your reports blow up. <laughs> like word for word, that was what you said. And you should be thinking about revenue reporting for SEO rather than just keywords is, is like, you know, uh, exactly what you're, you're saying here. Like, uh, it, it's exactly what I'm hearing. Yeah. I, and again, not for me, not new, right? In my book, mm. I said this and I always say report on revenue. This is a revenue channel. This, mm. you know, this is how you should measure it. But nobody did, right? Most companies don't. Most companies, like their SEO reporting consists of like a, a dashboard. Even the companies that I consult with and I convince them to do revenue reporting, they are always like, how come our SEMrush report says like our traffic is going down? Like it's not, first of all, we trust Google <laughs> Search Console. And second of all, who cares? Like this right. is rankings, like who cares? But mm. I think your company should report on revenue. If the report not reporting on revenue and they look at their SEMrush reports, what they're probably going to find, not, not specific to SEMrush, but any uh, ranking tool, they're going to find NA. Just going to say there's no ranking because like they're going to be blocked from crawling or good. Right. it may be on a keyword it will say there's you get this much traffic, but they won't anymore because SGE is going to answer that question. So the, that reporting doesn't matter. So if you're if every week you're sending a report to the executive team, this is how our SEO is doing. Someone's going to wake up and say like, I know you're sending these reports about how well we're doing, but revenue just disappeared. So mm. how do you uh, yeah. how do you align these two things? So that that's what I would I would say is like focus on revenue because that's where you should always be focusing on it. Yeah, it w probably will go down depending on you know what vertical you're in or you know, what kind of site you have. However, that's one truth. This is a good place to switch gears around career power ups. But before I do, I'm going to tell people again once to sign up for your newsletter. And then you mentioned your book quite a few times. So go get your book, Product Light SEO. Uh, and exactly what I hear, focus on the user and then go check out the guys' book, Product Light SEO. Let's talk about career power ups. Now, you you mentioned you worked at SurveyMonkey. You advise a ton of companies, including uh, I believe Tinder and other companies, like it's super huge public companies. And in your uh, two decades in, in marketing, I'm curious what's helped you accelerate your career? Like what's helped you level up as a marketer, as, you know, as an advisor now that's, you know, really stepped up your game? I'd say that probably the, the biggest thing that has helped my career and my personal brand and, and really everything is writing. Mm. And, you know, I wrote a book. Uh, that forced me to do a lot to really invest in in my thought processes and invest in you know not just rambling like putting words together and you did the same like it really really helps you come up with coherent thoughts that you need to convey to other people writing also is a general superpower like i was never really good at writing but i got much better at writing by writing so by writing i can share things that people may agree or disagree with on linkedin or twitter and uh, like you mentioned, my newsletter, everyone, please subscribe. Greatly appreciate anyway that does that. But like the same idea. Yeah. So like I've, I've coached people, like something I really like doing, like I, you know, now I'm a consultant. So when I had a full-time job, I had people that reported to me and I coached them because that was my job and I enjoyed it and watched them improve their careers and improve their lives like by having an easier time at work, by being more successful. Now I do it more as a consulting thing and I work with a couple of people and I coach them and help them in their careers but I'm not responsible for them. I missed that part. Mm. So the thing I always advocate for is right. Like you build your personal brand by putting your opinions out there and being forced to convey them in ways that other people will understand and relate to. That is, is that has been the one thing that has worked in my career. I think if I wouldn't write, I wouldn't have any visibility. So when people say, oh, ChatGPT and generative AI is going to replace all writing, I don't think so. Again, I, I love saying this because I, I think a lot of people don't understand like how LLMs work. It's statistics. Right. So 
when what generative AI does is it writes normal average content. It will not write bad content. It will not write good content. It will only write average content because mm. it has to write statistically right. average content. Now, the reason that generative AI is not totally boring is because it throws randoms in there. It would know it really like it's interesting. It throws a rate like let's say you do like what should come after the word what and the most likely possible what? word would be like should yes. let's say yeah right? should yeah but then the word it um did might be statistically less hmm. at times right. it will randomly choose the less statistic word so Same. now it has what did and then it calculates what comes after what did and that's that that is how it makes the content more interesting right it's stilted but it can write great content because intentionally it would have to right. accidentally randomly write great content so that uh, that ability to write great content will always exist mm. and you can write bad content that will always exist too <laughs> so so I, I would say anybody who wants to do anything to like improve their career write, right. like communicate maybe right. you can't write then like create videos but like you have right. to like put your thoughts out there so that that has been the one thing that has driven my career so good. i drove got a ton for my book and like that's a that was a big effort but in general, writing has always been something that has helped me. Like, blog, like I guest posted on all the search engine blogs, and I, you know, podcasts. Again, that's not writing, but putting opinions and thoughts out right. there has, has always been something that worked for me. I love that. Like, it really is like writing is a, a a way to filter and organize your thoughts, especially if like you're in a field that has a lot of chaos, like SEO right now. You're like able to organize it and structure it in a way. I feel like this ties, and you gave me a preview of exactly like an advice you would give your younger self. Uh, and if if I recall, it's around having an opinion. Can you can you share what the, an advice you would give your younger self? And I feel like it ties nicely with like writing as well. So the biggest thing and the biggest regret I have is not moving along faster, like mm. trying to be more structured in my career. Right. So like at, at my first job, I. Actually, I didn't, I didn't stay there too long, but really like not not chasing opportunities and not seeing right. things and just doing them. And, you know, you look back and you're like, oh, I could have left that job earlier. So when you're sitting in that job, you're like, should I leave? Should I not leave? No, just leave. Just just go get another job. Should you write that piece of content? Just write the piece of content. Right. So that would be the biggest advice is like not overthink those kinds of things. Mm. Just Just do it. Like I have found... Some of my best LinkedIn posts or some of my best blog posts took me 15 minutes to write because mm. it just like put it out there. Some of my worst posts took me four hours to write. I'm like, this is it. I got to put a ton of effort in there. Like I proofread right. it. I paid someone on Upwork to proofread it. I'm like, cause this is, this is going to be viral. A million people are going to see this. And then you launch it and like crickets. So, <laughs> oh no, just that would be my best piece of advice to my younger right. self is like, just mm. be you just like, try stuff so and then see where it goes and then improve on it and it, you know mm. everything's iterative and not not overthink it again like i got stuck at jobs like, worried about like promotions because like well how am i going to structure this instead of like just do stuff like my you know biggest thing ever happened in my career was one of those like well i just want to move to asia so mm. I, I just did right so wow i didn't really have a great plan or i did it organized and i found a job and then i ultimately stayed with survey monkey it was organized but it wasn't a great plan of like this is where this thing will go I think if I were to map it out, it would have not happened. It would have been like, that's the dumbest idea. Right. Like I owned a house. I owned a house. Right. I had two kids and I was like, oh, I think I throw it all away. Let's go to Asia for two years. Like let's do that. So it did. And it was like the best thing ever. So don't like, that'd be my best thing is like, do more of that. Like when I was younger, dude, just, just do it. I, that's such a good advice. I was watching this like um, YouTuber, Mark Rober, like giving advice to like the graduating class of MIT. And he's one of his advice was like, sometimes like blind ignorance or like uh, optimism around uh, something you don't know does well. Like if people thought about like, should I do this? And you map out all the things you're like, that's too hard. <laughs> I don't want to do that. And because of that, like people are more risk averse because they've they've kind of calculated out like what could go wrong. And because of that, like, no, I shouldn't do that. Exactly. You know that I think that comes with age and experience. Mm. So, and that's unfortunate because you're, everyone's always giving advice to their younger self without <laughs> the age and experience. And we, when you're younger and like older people tell you stuff, you're like, ah, 
boomer. <laughs> Big boomer. <laughs> you don't know what it's like for people like us. Right. right. So that's the problem. It's so like, if I look back at my experiences, my best experiences came from like not overthinking it. So if mm. I would give advice to my younger self, I'd say, don't overthink it. But as a younger self, I'm like, oh, I, I better be really strategic about this and think about this right. as much as possible. So that's, that's, you know, that's the unfortunate part of the whole thing. You got to mm. experience it and learn. And that, that advice applies so much to writing as well, where like, you mentioned it about like your most viral posts. You just wrote it in 15 minutes. Do you write with your phone? I'm curious. I had this advice from somebody like write with your phone because you type how you write or like what's your writing process look like? I'm curious, like for your newsletter or other things. So I hate this. I don't write with my phone. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I've met people who wrote, like I met somebody who wrote a, a best-selling, a Wall Street Journal, not a New York no. Times, but a Wall Street On Journal best-selling book. On voice. He's like, voice. I, I just like in the car wrote chapters to Google Docs. That's like crazy. Four. I can't do it because I don't write the way I speak. Right. I actually really need to like have a keyboard mm. in front of me. So I can't mm. do it on my phone. I can't do it on an iPad. Like I got to write and I pulled like schlep my keyword all, all over like my laptop to coffee shops to write. Right. So I, yes, even those viral posts, I, I did write them on a keyboard. I wish I could write it on my phone, but that is the process. Like I, I need yeah. that. I need that. Like I like again, I like the writing process, the big words and the right way of thinking things doesn't come across when I'm not on a mm. keyboard. Makes sense. Actually, I, had like a, I, had a, I had a good one the other day. Um, right. I wrote that uh, laying off your SEO team. I saw that. Wall, in, yeah. Yes. In the middle of a you know generational change. Right. In search is like throwing away your steering wheel while you're driving while down driving. the mountain. Yeah. Do you know how long I thought about what the analogy should be? It's like, is it skiing with your eyes closed? Right. Like all of those oh. things. I only came up with that on the keyboard. Like, cause I wanted the, I actually I got some comments about that's a good analogy. I wanted the visual. I wanted when right. you read that, that you thought of the visual, like how stupid would that be? Right. Like throw away, like you visualize a steering wheel flying out the window. And that came with a keyboard. I could not do that on my phone. So for that example, you already have like the the concept and you just need to think of that analogy. Do you come with a blank page and then you with a concept and then just just write? Or like do you lay out the structure and maybe that's too overthinking it where you're like, here's my points, it's what I'm gonna do. And maybe it depends if it's a newsletter or a LinkedIn post, if you have more structure. It depends on the reach of it. Yes. Right. So uh, if I, again, like some of these things, I'm like, this is really important. I lay it out. This is how I want to like open this. Is how I want to close. But that one, that was the idea. I knew I wanted to have the idea. And that was built off the fact that I get tons of emails from people. I don't know how this, I guess, it, and maybe I started this by helping people get jobs, but I get like at least once a day, I get an email from someone that said, Hey, I, I just got laid off. Yeah. Um, someone, someone told me that you're the person to reach out to. And like, I feel so bad because I actually don't know any current jobs that are hiring. I wish I could connect all these people. But now I've got like this queue of like 30 people who have all asked me to help refer them. So I just, every time someone says they're hiring, I'm like, here's 30 LinkedIn profiles. So that's where the idea came from. Like, I know we're in this once in generational change and I see these people that are emailing me, asking me for help and they're really good. They're like, mm -hmm. great experience. They all should be hired immediately. And that's where the idea for the post came. So I'm like, this is crazy. All these companies are right. letting go of who they need to guide mm -hmm. them through it. And then I had to come up with like, what's analogy? I just want to say like analogy has been the most important thing for me in selling internally. Right. So I think this is, you know, is a big challenge when it comes to marketers, especially SEO is they can't convey what they're trying to convey. So they, they fall back into jargon and try and sound really smart. They say things like, uh, LLM and generative AI and like, you know, AI and just say AI and everyone's eyes gloss over. Instead of really getting into analogy, so the thing that I always use when I'm selling, especially internally, is analogy. So like I had a, a role where the, this is a, a consulting role where the CEO yeah. was a huge sports fan and he didn't get SEO. He's just like, with the hear the whole thing and be like, that's great. Okay, no budget, done, get out of the room. So mm -hmm. I came up with a sports analogy, which is I showed SEO as an assist. Right. Mm. If, you know, you have assists cool. in hockey, right. you have or in soccer, basketball. you have assists right. yeah. in, in basketball. Right. So I showed this right. gif of like an assist. It was a basketball assist right. where like I forget who it was, like 
he got the ball and then he passed the ball and then the other person dunked it. And I just had this gift overplaying on the slide. Right. It was like, so what we do in SEO is we're building the brand. And I just kept talking over this gift. I scored more budget than I ever, I got two employees out of it, right? Like I scored two full-time employees. So the so power good. of analogy is, is yeah. so good because again, when it comes to SEO, it's like, oh, well, there's rankings. And then they're like, oh, well, so just put more keywords on. Well, you can't actually put more keywords in because then the algorithm downweights it. So what we need to do is we need to get some links or just buy a bunch of links. Well, if we buy two, so, so, so then you lose them. But if you like, don't, I'm not going to bore you with the details, but it's an assist. So oh, we God. really want to get the best, I don't mm. know if that's the right word, a sister here. So right. No, that's cool. Give us as much money. So we buy the right a, a person that's good at assist, score more budget. The other analogy I use, this happens to me all the time. Companies are like, well, we spend you know, $40 million a month on paid marketing. SEO is not really a thing. It doesn't work anymore for us. So then mm-hmm. I use the analogy about rented versus bought. So when you're when you're doing paid marketing, you're renting a house. Mm-hmm. When you do when you're right. buying when you're doing SEO, you're buying a house. Yes, you could still get foreclosed on. You could still get meth heads moving next door and destroy the value of your property. But provided all that doesn't happen, you've built equity. So if you do go on vacation, you are still earning no matter what. Like, you know, you can fire your whole SEO team, you still drive SEO traffic. You fire your agency, you fire your pay team, you do not have paid traffic anymore. So like a a power of analogy, I think is really important. So when I'm trying to get a point across, I always use analogy. So good. That's a really good uh, writing power up, (laughs) so to speak. But that was a fun chat with Eli about AI and SEO. You can learn more about Eli and his work by subscribing to his newsletter, productledseo.substock.com. Follow him on LinkedIn and Twitter and go buy his book, Product Led SEO. All of those links are in the show notes and description. Thanks to Eli for being on the show. If you enjoyed this episode, you'd love the Marketing Power Ups newsletter. I share the actionable takeaways and break down the frameworks of world-class marketers. You can go to marketingpowerups.com to subscribe and you'll instantly unlock the three best frameworks that top marketers use to hit their KPIs consistently and wow their colleagues. I want to say thank you to you for listening and Please like and follow Marketing Power Ups on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. If you feel like extra generous, kind of leave a review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify and leave a comment on YouTube. It goes a long way in others finding out about Marketing Power Ups. Thanks to Mary Sullivan for creating the artwork and design. And thank you to Faisal Kaigo for editing the intro video. And of course, thank you for listening. That's all for now. Have a powered up day. Marketing Power Ups. Until the next episode...